Sean on 2FM. And you're very welcome back. This week is the 100th anniversary of Leash's only All-Ireland hurling win. On October the 24th, 1915, Leash beat Cork by six goals and two points to four goals and one in the final. I'm delighted to be joined on the show by John Finley, whose grandfather Jack captained the team that day, and by Teddy Finley, GA author and editor of the book to commemorate the win, Leash All-Ireland 1915, which will be launched uh, this Friday in Abbey Leagues. You're both very welcome, gents. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Um, listen, John, I, I, if I can start with you, it, it must be quite a, a source of pride for you and for the family to be able to reflect on the fact that your grandfather, Jack, and his brother, Tom, were part of Leash's only All-Ireland victory. Yeah, no, there's a, a historic uh, occasion for Leash, and considering that we haven't repeated uh, the historic win since, it, it means, means that it's, I suppose there's an extra significance in this year. And that's why between the club and the county board and, our, and relatives of the family, we felt that we needed to do something, uh, maybe to tell the story that was never really told uh, of how that team achieved uh, such a great success and the players that were involved in it. Yeah, and we don't have a huge amount of time tonight to go through the entire thing, but we'd like to try and get you know some of the key points. And Teddy, I suppose you know the team itself, looking back at the time, um, would this have been a surprise? They were beaten in the final the previous year, but they obviously had a strong squad to go and contest this final. Uh, yes, uh, they had a strong squad. It was certainly uh, no fluke. It wasn't by accident that they won it. Hmm. It was achieved by what definitely there were quality players they were well organised and they were well trained. Yeah, because I mean, you you made that point um, when we were talking off air that you know, in fact, they were very well dr- drilled. They were very fit side at the time. Was that a was it an almost a revolutionary approach to training that they took in terms of how fit they were and how organised they were? Well, it was very revolutionary. Although Clare the previous year in 1914 had undergone gone a serious program of training as well. But um, the, the type of collective training that Leash uh, underwent in 1915 was something was something really uh, special at the time. Um, th- th- actually, uh, they trained just as hard, or probably harder, in 1914, shall I say, Hugh. Yeah. But, but uh, a lot of the players afterwards felt that they had overdone the training, and on the big day <laughs> when it counted, they didn't perform, but uh, certainly met up for it in 1915. Yeah, and how many teams have we seen use that excuse over the years? This gas just goes to show you. I mean, in terms of, of your grandfather then, Jack, I mean, have you a lot of memories of him, John? Yeah, well, it just was just add to what Teddy was saying. When, you, when, when we think of how professional teams are prepared nowadays, like these were a fantastic bunch of athletes, considering that most of them were uh, having or were working manually on farms at the time. But they actually went into training in, in 1914 for three solid weeks in, in Fort Leash. So while it was a different era, uh, uh, the level of, of, uh, of athletic ability and training that the, that the players endured uh, was quite uh, similar to what a lot of teams uh, uh, do nowadays. But I suppose uh, the, the other thing I suppose that's interesting is that uh, like a granduncle of mine actually went on to win an All Ireland with Dublin in 24. That was Tom. So wanted, yeah, Tom Finley, yeah, as well as having a career with the Irish Army uh, um, at, uh, in the show jumping arenas. But probably the most interesting story that came out of the research of the book was in relation to a player called Joe Phelan, who went to Kieran's College. And uh, when we started research on the book, uh, people said that he was a bit odd and that they didn't know how to return up for the match. On <laughs> and uh, that he hadn't travelled with the team on the Saturday night. And uh, they woke up the next morning to find Joe poking the ball against the back wall of the hotel. And uh, we so- subsequently found out that he, he actually had joined the priesthood in Minute and, and hadn't been let out and that he got out that day for the day to play the All-Ireland. Uh, but whether he enjoyed himself too much after winning the All-Ireland or not, uh, he left the priesthood uh, <laughs> three or four months later. And uh, he, uh, it was such a disgrace to the family at the time that he was told never to come back to Balagin or Balakala in Leash. And uh, Joe then decided to go on and do medicine in his spare time. And he actually hurled with Dublin, uh, and he hurled between 17 and 20 and played three more All-Irelands uh, with, with Dublin and won two medals. So he actually played in four All-Irelands and had three medals. So it, it just shows you the calibre of athletes that a lot of the players were in, in, on that team. Teddy, you don't see too many guys now who, who um, start out with one county and finish with another, and particularly guys like Tom uh, Finlay, who was able to win All-Irelands with two different counties. Well, the, the, the rules at the time... Uh, the, the favour Dublin, shall we say, because anybody anybody that worked in Dublin more or less had to play with Dublin clubs, and then if they were good enough to play with Dublin teams, and they had a whole stream of top class players that won all Ireland with Dublin. Dan O'Neill, I think he won four all Ireland with Dublin from 1924 to 1938, and uh, Tom Finley in 1924, 
Joe Phelan and and there's others as well. And um, so that, that's uh, Dublin's gain was definitely Leash's loss, but not only Leash, but uh, every hurling county in the country contributed to Dublin's All Ireland at the time. John, I was reading John a story about the night before the game itself. I mean, the team were staying in a, in a hotel, I think, on Gardner Street in Dublin. And if I'm if I'm right, there there had to be pretty tight security patrolling the corridors in case a few of the lads felt like going on a night out in Dublin and ruined their chances the next day. Yeah, no, the, in fairness to the county board, they were taking no chances. And this, they actually stayed in Wynn's Hotel because at that stage, uh, Jones's Road had just had just been bought the, the year before. So it was actually the, the first All Ireland uh, number in, in 14 that was played when it went down from 17 aside to 15 aside. But there was obviously no facilities there. So they actually talked out in the hotel the next morning and, and walked to Jones's Road. Uh, but uh, the, the, the county board uh, had, had all uh, those avenues co- uh, covered. And it, uh, so much to the extent that. There was a huge rivalry between the two clubs that provided nearly 10 of the players. And um, the, there was, the two clubs had been drawn against one another in 1915. And the county board called off the match until after the All-Ireland in case that they'd actually go out and try and damage one another. <laughs> it's gas. Yeah. Uh, Teddy, I'm just looking at the score here, 6-2 to 4-1, which would be almost unheard of nowadays in the hurling world. Was that typical of the scorelines back in them days or was it just a one-off? It was actually very typical because... Uh, there were fewer points scored in goals generally in, in games, but uh, six six two to four one was a convincing win, and um, and there was a man called John Heine scored three goals and three goals in an All Ireland final <laughs> even now with, yeah. with, some, with some contribution. I hope he kept and, the slitter. How, <laughs> how important it is uh, to people in Leash the, the win of nineteen fifteen. Hmm. And I sp- yeah. I presume there was no talk of uh, sweeper systems and blankets and all sorts back then. Oh, they, they were, well, they had their own tactics, I'm sure, mm. anyway, and, and they, they were well organised. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, things are achieved by having leaders, to say. And uh, we were lucky enough to have a county chairman at the time, Father Cardi, who took a particular interest in hurling. And he introduced a, a very business-like administration here. And he was brilliant in the field of organising and delegation and, uh, and player management. And, uh, and then you had leaders on the team. You had the, the likes of Jack Carroll, who was the captain, from, the captain in 1914 from Kilcotton. He was a heroic figure. You, you mentioned Jack Finley from Ballygain. He was a, a very much respected hurling figure as well. And then there was Bob O'Keefe, who was a fine hurler in his day, and he worked tirelessly behind the scenes. And he went on to become president of the GA. But they, were, they, were, they weren't short of their leaders. In terms of the day itself, John, I mean, I, you know, reading various reports, by all accounts, it was absolutely me- miserable weather-wise. Yeah, no, it was it just... Sorry, it was, yeah, there seemed to be a, a very wet day, and, and they obviously they, they wore uh, raincoats at half time just to keep themselves warm <laughs> until, until, the, until the second half uh, started. But I, I think just one of the other interesting points that when we started researching the book, obviously we, it was it was about the, the players and 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 the, 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 the road to Co Park. But uh, we actually found that two of the players of that period ended up in World War One in Belgium. Uh, and then, like the the role uh, that the GA played, uh, then from from the Easter Rising, it, it, uh, six months later, uh, through the War of Independence and the Civil War, actually forms a large part of the book, and and is an extremely interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, John, are you there? Yeah, can you? Sorry, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. In terms of the book, I mean, look, there's a there's a launch uh, obviously on on Friday night. It's in Abbey Leaks, and uh, I presume there'll be a lot of people there. And, and and in terms of your own family, John, I mean, I imagine there must be a, a pretty significant occasion for them. Yeah, no. As it, as it, tur- as it turned out, like my 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 grandfather died when my father was ten, and our father died when, when we were relatively young. So there was very few stories that passed down. So and but when we went around researching the book, actually, a lot of people hadn't a lot of stories to tell and had sm- uh, snippets of stories. So uh, thanks to Teddy's work and, and De- Declan Byrne, who researched the book with him, uh, we, we put together a fantastic profile uh, uh, and, and sequence to the match. And it, it, the admission is free. And uh, the UCD historian, Paul Rouse, uh, that has published a number of books on the GA speaking on the night. And we'd be delighted if everybody would turn up and a great night is ensured. Game on.